hope that you've gained and understood what I've been trying to say. That America was the first nation in the world. What makes us exceptional compared to every other nation in the world is that America was the first nation that said this. We want to be free and we are given right by our creator. We've been given rights by our creator. This is the first nation in the world that didn't say government gives us rights. But rather, God gave us rights. And what they did is they sent and they went out to set up an institution of government that agreed with God's rights that we've been given. That's what they set out to do. I believe they did a pretty good job of it, too. I mean, it's lasted for over 200 years, so they've done a great job. Now, I will say that as time has gone on, we're getting further and further away from that. And that's why it's good for us to talk about this in church and be drawn back to the idea that this is a blessed land and why this is a blessed land. And we've covered that in the last three weeks. Now, this week, I want to talk about how can God heal our land? How can God heal our land? And I, for, I believe... First and foremost, you have to recognize that we are sick. How can we talk about God healing a land if we don't recognize we're sick? How many of you believe America's sick? Yeah, yeah we're sick. And I know what some people might think. If you are mentally or if you, if you have a mindset for money, you might believe that uh, we have a, a financial sickness. If you're a person who believes in great morals and all that, you might believe we have a moral sickness. If you're a person that believes in the family, in the institution of family, you might think we have a family sickness. If you're a person that believes in, uh, you know, uh, the, the proper definition of marriage between one man and one woman, you might think we have a marriage sickness. I mean, there are several different types of sicknesses that you might look at America and say that we might have. But if you was to sum it down to the bottom lowest common denominator, let me just propose to you this morning that we have a spiritual sickness. It's a spiritual sickness. All those things, those different manifestations of sickness, whether it be a financial, the financial sickness is rooted in spiritual sickness. The moral sickness that America has is rooted in the spiritual sickness of America. Every avenue of sickness that America has, it's rooted in the spiritual aspects of the thing. Our problem is a spiritual problem. Now, before we even go any further, I just want to draw your attention to what I believe the greatest American spiritual sickness is. Now, I'm going to go to the Word of God, and we're going to look at it from a Bible perspective. And at first, you're not going to see where I'm coming from, but just stick with me through it, and I want to show you something here. If you got your Bible, you can turn there, or you can watch it up on the screens. 2 Samuel chapter 23, it says something like this. These are the names of the mighty men of David, all right? Jasheb, who bass fished. Uh, Y'all get that later. Uh, uh, the Tachamite, all right? The chief among the captains. He was also called Adino, the Esnite, because he had killed 800 men at one time. I don't know what y'all are thinking, but I'm thinking, that is a bad brother. That is a bad dude. I ain't killed 800 folks. Wiped out a small town type dude. I mean, you know, nobody's talking about, about his mama. <laughs> ain't no doubt. Nobody's signing up for that class. How about this? Verse 9. And after him was Eli Eleazar, the son of Dodo. Now, anybody that has a name like that... You better be able to fight. Can I get a witness in here? I mean, who's your daddy? Dodo. <laughs> and I dare you to say something. Yeah, anybody with me on that? I mean, here we got Dodo, the son of Dodo. <laughs> I love the Bible. It's so funny to me. All right? I can't make this stuff up. It's so good. The Ash uh, Hoahite, and you know... I ain't even going there if he had a sister. And you know nobody said nothing about her either. Some of y'all get that later. A whole height. <laughs> it's like joke bombs. It's like it goes off at different ripples. It's like, oh, I get it now. I get it. 
<laughs> so funny. So you got Dodo and the Hoahite, all right? They're bad people, man. When, what, now watch this. The, one of the three mighty men, I guess my point is this. If you, want your, if you have a son, if you're an expecting mom and you want a tough kid, name him something real sissy. Name him something real sissy. Like Sue. <laughs> There's a song about that. <laughs> That was my point. I'm moving on. He goes, And the men of David, when they defiled the Philistines who were gathered for battle, and the men of Israel retreated. Look at that. And the who? The men of who? Israel retreated. Do y'all see that? The, the, listen, here's the pattern. Under Saul's leadership, here's what would happen. They would often, oftentimes go down the battle, but then they'd run. They'd just run all the time. They'd just run. David comes along. He gathers around himself these mighty men. I mean, one of these brothers, you know, killed 800 dudes by himself, all right? Another one, Dodo's son, you know, is whipping everybody. Now, now, now watch this, verse 10. And he arose and he attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand was stuck to the sword. How many of you know that's a bad dude right there? He's been holding on to the sword so long it's stuck to his hands. He's like Edward Scissorhands or something. The Lord brought, now watch this. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the people returned after him to the plunder. Now, now, are you seeing something? Here's what I want you to see. I want you to see that there was a man who stood up, who went and fought, and then the Bible says these words, and the Lord brought about a great victory that day. Are y'all seeing what I'm seeing? I, I, I want you to see that a man stood up, and then the Lord brought about a great victory that day. That a man stood up, and the Lord brought about a great victory that day. I'm going to say it one more time for you. That a man stood up, man or woman, stood up, and then the Lord brought about a victory that great day. See, see, I believe that the greatest spiritual sickness we have in America, especially amongst the church, is the apathetic church member. Folks that just don't stand up. They, they talk about the battle. They're like Saul's guys. They talk about the fight. They look at the fight from afar off. And they go, wow, somebody ought to do something about that. Wow, well, isn't that a terrible thing that's going on there? Wow, isn't it terrible what they're doing over here? Well, isn't it terrible what they're doing over there? Isn't that terrible what's going on over there? But yet they, they look at the battle, but when they're asked to, come, to participate, they refuse to participate. And they look at the battle from afar off. But this is not the way David's men were. David's men saw the battle and ran to the battle to fight the battle. And then, inevitably, here's what happens. And the Lord brought about. I love that. I love that because it tells me something. It says that God is always looking to win, but he always needs someone to fight. And the problem is most people don't want to fight. They'd rather lay down. Let's read on because I, I dig this next brother. I dig him. He's awesome. And after him was Shama. You ain't talking about his mama either. Shammah, the son of Agi, the Herahite, the Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there, were, there was a piece of ground full of lentils. Now, mind you, this is just a piece of ground with beans in it, with beans. And you know what? Every year, I don't know how long the Bible doesn't say, the Philistines would come down and take those beans from those people. Well, there was one day when a man stood up and said, you know what? They've been taking our beans year after year. When are we going to stand up and fight? When are we going to stand up and do something about this? So he did. Watch what, what happens. So the Philistines gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. So the people fled from the Philistines. Notice, they fled. But watch him, Shama. But he stationed himself in the middle of the field. He defended it and killed the Philistines. Look at the next verse. So the Lord brought about a great victory. That day. Isn't that powerful? Shama. Some beans. Standing in the field. Can I ask you a question? Is it really about the beans? Has nothing to do with the beans. Has everything to do with an enemy. Who's trying to take away what they had been given. They had broke the ground for those beans. They had worked the ground for those beans. Those beans belong to them. But yet every time the harvest comes around. Here come the Philistines, running the people off. But there was one day, Shammah said, you know what? I've seen this for far too long. I'm going to stand right here. 
And if I'm the only one that stands, so be it. And the Bible says he was. He was the only dude that stood. He stood there in the middle of the bean field, and he defended the pea patch. He defended that pea patch, and I bet you this, I bet you nobody ever attacked the pea patch again. See, we, we, we think it takes a whole bunch of people to stand up and change the world, but it really doesn't. It only took one man, Shama, to take and change the face of the war with the Philistines. Stood up in the middle of that pea patch and he said, I dare somebody to try and take these beans. Because here's the truth. Had nothing to do with the beans. Had to do with the mindset that's in the people. Had to do with the mindset that's on the people. Had to do with the mindset that's on Shama. Shama said, you know what? I'm not going to let you take the beans today. And if I die defending it, I'll die defending it. I'm going to keep this bean field ourselves. You ain't getting it. And I just, to me, it just speaks volumes, volumes, volumes about where we're at in America, in American history, in American culture. Because so oftentimes Christians talk about the negative aspects of what's going on in America. And I would agree. I talk about the negative aspects of it too. I understand. We're sick. I'm not here trying to deny our sickness. But here's what I am here to tell you. I am here to tell you that it may seem like just a bean field, but it's worth fighting for. Listen to this. In 1962, had you stood up and said this, hey, it's just them taking the Bible out of school. You know what? 95% of the culture would have agreed with you. But I would argue this. We didn't defend the pea patch of the Bible in schools. And because of that, it got thrown out. And at the time, the culture was like, hey, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? It's nothing. I tell you, it wasn't nothing but a pea patch, but it mattered. It wasn't nothing but Bible coming out of school, but it mattered. It, they didn't, see, they, they, it's just peas. What's the deal? It's just the Bible coming out of school. Or it's just prayer not being allowed in school. I mean, what's the big deal? It can go. It's no big deal. I mean, we surrender. We don't want to fight. Why? We want peace at any cost. Peace at any cost isn't peace. That's right. Amen. Peace at any cost is not peace. You can't have peace if you're giving up everything. And too many Christians are giving it up, giving up, giving up, giving up. They're just not willing to fight. They're not willing to war. They're not willing to say, listen, this is my pea patch and you're not coming in it. I'm sorry, but you can't have these peas. You can't. And it isn't even about the peas. It's more about what the peas represent than it is the peas itself. Y'all hear what I'm saying? What am I trying to say? Let me break it down in a regular common denominator vernacular here. Here's the truth. There is a person called the devil, Satan, Lucifer, a fallen angel, angel who desires to destroy America and everything that it stands for. And he has been on the march for a long time, time trying to destroy it. And I do not believe that our problem is ne necessarily financial or, or moral or this or that or the other. I believe that all those are a common denominator of a spiritual problem a spiritual problem and the problem with most people is they are trying to fix a spiritual problem in a natural world a spiritual problem in a natural world and I'm telling you as long as you play that game you're always going to be subservient you're always going to lose I'm here to tell you that if we're going to win this battle and we're going to win America and we're going to win America back to its roots and everything we're going to have to start in a spiritual position because it's a higher level a spiritual place where we can encounter the enemy and defeat the enemy on a spiritual plane so that we can bring about a spiritual victory. Amen? Amen. It's a spiritual war. The Bible says we battle not against flesh and blood. In other words, the person of the opposite party in the White House or in my house or in any other house is not my enemy. The enemy is the devil who desires to steal, kill, and destroy. Amen? Now, he will use any means and every means necessary to try and destroy people. But the whole purpose of this thing is it is a spiritual war. Now, it's very easy for us in this war to point a finger at somebody else and say they ought to be doing more. They ought to be doing more. People in Washington ought to be doing more. People in the State House ought to be doing more. People in Kokomo should be doing more. Well, I'm here to tell you we can pray for all those things, but the truth of the matter is we can't start there. We don't start outside. We start right here in us. Right here in us. Right here in us, I think of 2 Chronicles 7, 14. It says this, if my people, if my people, look at it right here on the screen. If my people, who's God start with? The church, the people. If my people. God isn't looking at the world and going, oh my goodness, they're going to hell in a handbasket. That isn't what God's saying. 
Here's what God is saying. God's saying, hey, listen, I have my church in the world, and they have the responsibility of reaching the world. Y'all hear what I'm saying? That's what God sees. God sees the problem of America as the problem of the church. And that if the world is ever going to be changed, it's going to start in the church. Now, i got a question for you. If my people, if my people, are you one of God's peoples? Are you a peep? Are you a peep? Because if you're a peep, then God's talking to you. If my peep, my peeps, if my peeps will get it together, I have no problem touching the world. No problem touching the world. But it's all about my peeps. If my peeps can get it together, then I'm going to touch the world. And I will tell you, I will tell you, I will tell you, I will tell you. I have never, ever, now, I didn't grow up in church, but I will tell you this. I've never, ever seen a place that the church is in like it's in now. We've got preachers, pastors, so-called men of God that stand in pulpits that agree with evil in the earth, agree with it, and support it. I'll get on that here in a minute. But I'm telling you, that's not right. If my people, let's just work this out for a few minutes. If my people who are called by my name, look at it right here, who are called by my name shall humble themselves, pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will what? Heal their land. How many of you want America healed? My goodness, I do. I do. I do. I want America healed. Now, if I want America healed, then I have to buy into the recipe. Now, here's the deal. Oftentimes with Christians, let me tell you what happens. Let's say, let's say that your goal in life is to bake a chocolate cake. Let me even like some chocolate cake. I love cake. How many of you remember Bill Cosby? God is great. Gave us chocolate cake. Come on, anybody know that? If you're young, you don't even know what I'm talking about. But Bill, Bill, anybody remember cassette tape? Bill Cosby. Let me remember vinyl, Bill Cosby. All right, anyway, I'm moving on. I, I, that, by the way, that was way older than me. But anyway, all right. <laughs> all right. Uh, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> all right, here's the, tr- here's the deal, though. Here's the deal. A lot of times, let's say you, hypothetically you want a chocolate cake. You want a chocolate cake. Now, there's two ways to go about it. All right? Number one. You can go into your kitchen, and you can throw some flour, some eggs, and then about anything else you want into a bowl. You can get your finest, uh, what's those mixers? Uh, KitchenAid. Get that baby working it. You can take and put that thing in the oven, and then hope something comes out all right. How many of you know if you cook like me, there ain't nothing good coming out of that right there? (laughs) Right? Michelle asked me, hey, how'd you get that spicy like that? I don't know. I just started dumping stuff. (laughs) I can never make anything twice. Ain't no doubt about it. All right? But now listen. But how many of you know if you really want a chocolate cake, you go buy a box. That's the way I do it. (laughs) And watch this. There's something on the back. Come on, talk to me. The instructions. Am I right? See, because listen to this. We want God to build us a cake, but oftentimes we want God to hand us the cake. And most of the times God, if you have not figured this out about God, let me, let me bring you into the picture here. You say, God, I want this in my life. God says, great, here's a recipe. And you go, God, I don't want a recipe. God said, here's a recipe. I'm going to teach you something. I'm going to show you how to make it. Come on, y'all hear what I'm saying? I'm going to show you how to make it. Because God understands the value of building something in you more than just, boom, slapping it in your, in your, in your lap. Which, I, Lord, I want free from depression. I, I just want you to do it, God. God says, no, you're going to have to meditate on my word. You're going to have to submit to my word. God, I want to be healed. God says, all right, you're going to have to forgive if you want your body healed. You're going to have to. 
See, we oftentimes, we just want it, and God says, no, 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 no. God works through process. And the process is this, you have to buy into the recipe. If we're going to have our nation healed, we have to buy into the recipe. What is the recipe? Let's break it down word for word here. If my people, my people, are you one of God's people? All right, then. Here's what, here's what you need to know. Number one, you need to know that you are to be this right here. Look at Matthew 5.13. You are the what? Salt of the earth. And if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is good for nothing but to be thrown and be trampled down under the foot of men. Hey, here's the truth. I think a lot of times the church has lost its saltiness. And then we wonder why the world don't want a taste of it. I'm here to tell you, if you will live authentically before God, I'm telling you, Christianity is almost irresistible. It's irresistible. Hey, look at me. Okay, maybe, maybe I'm a bad spokesman. I don't know. I mean, but on a serious note, have you ever met some people that, that, that you walked away from? Let's say you're a Christian. You're a Christian, right? You God's peeps? All right, you're, you're one of God's peeps. And you walk into another person who says they're one of God's peeps. And you meet them and you're like, I don't like them. And they're saying they're one of God's peeps. And everything they're doing isn't God's peeps. They're annoying or at best dead peeps. I met people. They don't know. I love it when people don't know what I do. I really do. Like, how, how are you? Hi, I'm good. I'm good. And they're like, oh, yeah. You know Jesus? Yeah? Well, if you don't, I'd like to introduce you to him. Okay. What do, what, what's that mean? Well, see, what you need to do is you need to come to my church. We're all excited just like me. About what God's, and they don't, they do it, they can't, I can't even do it without a smile. Come to my church. <laughs> I mean, they are the worst salesmen. You know, I want to slap them and say, I'm, I'm glad you don't go to our church. And if you do go to our church, please don't tell anybody you go to our church. Because <laughs> you are ruining it. You are tearing up our church. <laughs> Why? Because I believe true, authentic Christianity is irresistible, man. It's irresistible. If my people are the salt of the earth, Jesus said you're to be salt, man. You're to be the flavor. What does salt do? I'll give you three things for sure that, that every salty Christian, whoops, every salty Christian in here does. You ready? You preserve. I know the world says that we're the problem and we're the pain. But here's the truth. The world would be a whole different place if we weren't here. The world will have its chance during the Antichrist to have its way with the earth. And we'll see how all that turns out about seven years later. It's not good. My point is, we preserve the earth. Christians do. We are the salt. Here's what else we do. Flavors. We add flavor to it. Think about America for the first 200 years. Think about it. What made America great was the idea that you have all these different people with all these different backgrounds, all these different things, but they all had Judeo-Christian values at their core. And I would dare say we're starting to change that now, and that's a shame. That's a shame. Because what it's going to do, it's going to fracture America in so many places it isn't even funny. That's why we need to pray now for God to heal our land. Heal our land. Bring us back under that covering. Here's the, here's the last one. It heals. Do you know salt heals? Salt heals. Absolutely. Salt heals. Now, let me ask you this. Are you a salty Christian? See, we, 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 we want God to heal our land. We want God to move in America. But it's real easy for us to point the finger at else and say, not me, God. I'm here to tell you, well, Michael Jackson, I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I don't know anything. About, okay, I'll stop. I'll stop. That was my best Michael impression, y'all. <laughs> hey, but listen, here's the truth. That's where you got to start. He had, Michael had something going on with that. Yeah, I mean, he made money. But hey, on a serious note, I'm making fun. But on a serious note, do you not agree that that's where you got to start? 
Yeah, that's where you got to start. You got to start with you. So let me ask you this. Are you, let me ask you if you're salty and you say, yes, I'm salty. Well, then let me ask you this. Do you prefer comfort and convenience or commitment and character? Comfort and convenience? I tell you, part of the problem that America is sick is because we got a whole bunch of spiritual people say they're saved and say they love God, but they want comfort and convenience over character and commitment. Over character and commitment. Comfort and convenience. What can you give me? What can you do for me? What can, how about this? Don't do nothing for me. <laughs> Let's start there. <laughs> do nothing for me. You all hear what I'm saying? All right? I'd rather God do something in me. Character. Commitment. If you're a salty Christian, you're supposed to be a person of character. Person of commitment. All right? You're supposed to be the salt supposed to be the soul of the earth. You're supposed to be different from the world. Barna did a research study that showed that 95% of Christians have no different view on the world than non-believers. They believe the same thing as the world. They're, They're Christian in title only. They go to church on Sunday, but they're not salty. I'm here to ask you, are you salty this morning? Are you salty? Are you salty? You're supposed to be salty. You're supposed to be a little different. You're supposed to have some flavor in your life, some God flavor in your life. See, I'll be honest with you. I wasn't always salty. I wasn't always salty. I remember there was a time, I, I get, before I get, I'll give you an example, just something here, and I've been talking about three weeks. I might as well talk about it one more time. Um, uh, whenever I first got saved, well, before I got saved, before I got saved, I believed in abortion. I thought, hey, it's a woman's body, whatever, that's her business. Everybody ought to leave her alone. Uh, Really, that's what I thought. I didn't know any better. I wasn't raised in church. And to me, it seemed like the logical step. Leave everybody alone, let everybody mind their own business, right? Made sense to me. Then guess what happened? I gave my heart to Christ. So here I am, born again, loving God, all right? But guess what? Do you believe in abortion? Yeah, yeah. I believe you can have an abortion. I believe that. It's all right. Now, you you may be shocked, but listen, understand, I'm 20 years old, and I've been taught by a secular system of what values are. Really? Okay? So here I am, a Christian, going to church, supposedly love God, and believe in abortion. Hmm. But then here's what happened. I started reading the Bible. Start reading the Bible. And as I started reading the Bible, I read in Jeremiah, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. Ooh, hold up, time out. Time out. Time out, time out. Time out. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. But God, God says he's forming people in their mother's womb. And I don't know about you, but if I'm over here at the beach building sand castles, and you go putting your foot in my castle... I'm going to have a problem with your foot. Come on, this is common sense, y'all. I start, Here's what happened. I had these worldly views that were not salty. But I was going to church. And then I started reading this Bible, and I started realizing this. If I'm going to be a salty believer, I've got to begin to give up some of my own thinking And believe what God says. Now let me tell you the problem with this. And now follow me on this, y'all. Follow me. And and some of you, this is going to really, really help you. So pay attention. Watch this. This is what I've learned about God. And it's amazing how it works. It's amazing. But this is the way it is. From my vantage point. I always wanted head knowledge before heart knowledge. So for example, I would read in the Bible where it says, that abortion is wrong. One of the seven abominations unto God. All right? But then I would, in my head, I'm like, I don't get it. Why is that such a big deal? I don't get it. My head would argue with the Bible. Maybe some of you are there. Your head argues with the Bible all the time. Let me explain where the problem is. It's not your Bible. 
There's only one other thing in the equation. It's your head. So here's what happened. I begin to do this. I begin to say this to God. God, I don't understand it, but I choose with my heart to believe it. Hmm. Yeah. Let me tell you something. If you want to get somewhere in God, start believing things with your heart. See, because watch, here's the way it works. I wanted my head to change my heart. It'll never work. If you're trying to change your heart from your head, you got it backwards. Here's the way the Bible works. You believe the Bible with your heart. Believe it with your heart. You may not understand it. You may not comprehend it. You may not be able to wrap your mind around it. But you believe it with your heart. When you believe it with your heart, let me tell you what happens. Your head follows. Your head follows. It's not the other way around. Too many Christians try to live from their head, and then they want their heart to follow. You got it wrong. You're upside down. You have to believe it with your heart, the Bible says, and then you get understanding of it. I'll give you an example of this with tithing. Whenever I was, before I was saved, I used to think that every preacher was trying to get my money. <laughs> now I'm one of them, I know. All right, whatever. Hey, but here's the truth. I used to hear them say this all the time. If you will tithe, give up one-tenth of your income to God, you'll have more and you'll be blessed. I thought, now, brother, I'm not that smart, but I know if you have 100 and you take 10 away, that means I have less? That's how my mind works? Now, I went to Kokomo, and I could have bad math. <laughs> but, but last time I checked, if you take 10 away from 100, you only got 90, right? Because your head can't wrap your, itself around it. It cannot. Because faith is not head knowledge. Faith is heart knowledge. Now watch me. Get saved. Get my heart to Christ. I, I start reading in the Bible where tithing is what God desires. So watch this. It didn't make sense, but I believed in my heart. I obeyed from my heart. Watch. And then after I started obeying, my head started understanding. My head started understanding. I was like, oh, I get it. The light, light bulb. The light bulb came on, and here I am understanding, oh, I get it. If I will give a portion, God will bless the rest. Some of you in here, you don't understand or agree with tithing. That's okay. Well, first of all, we'll take the blessing of tithe, whether you agree with it or not. It's what God says that matters. But here's the most important thing. If you wait for your head to wrap around the idea of tithing, you'll never do it. If you, watch this, if you try and wrap your head around the idea that a guy died 2,000 years ago who was God, and you try and wrap your head around that, you'll, it'll blow you away. The other day, Mike and I were having a conversation that blew him away. And it was just something we were pondering. We were talking about God and all this. And, uh, and, I, and I said, Michael was talking about inventions and all this. And I said, Mike, check this out. Have you ever thought about this? I said, God has never had an idea. Think about what I just said. Yeah, he looked at me just like most of you. God has never had an idea. In other words, God didn't wake up one day and go, I got an idea. Y'all hear what I'm saying? He, he doesn't wake up with ideas. He is idea. He knows all. It, it isn't like he can wake up one day and go, wow, I got a new idea. Let's try something different. No, he has the perfect idea every time, all the time. Wrap your head around that. Wrap your head around the Trinity. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You know what most people do? Well, I can't wrap my head around it, therefore I don't believe it. Well, I don't care what your head says. I'm telling you what the Bible says. Even if your head can't wrap itself around it, that's all right. Believe the Bible. Because once you believe the Bible in your heart, then your head will line up. Come on, y'all hear what I'm saying? It's good stuff. Good stuff. Look at it. He says this. Here's what he said. He said, my people are the salt of the earth. Check this out, verse 33 of Matthew 6. He says this, but seek ye first God's and his what? 
And all these things shall be what? Added unto you. Do you guys want to be God's peeps? Then you need to be salt. If you're going to be salt, then you have to put his kingdom before your own. You have to put his kingdom before your opinion. You've got to put his kingdom before your ideas. You have to put him first and you second. Isn't that powerful? See, oh, Pastor Charlie, I thought we were going to talk about saving America. I'm trying. <laughs> but you've got to work with me here. Amen. You know? You've got to be salt. You've got to be light. How do you do it? You do it by giving up your own opinion and believing God's word about your opinion. Yeah, right? Yeah. There are things in the Bible I don't agree with. Welcome to the party. I don't. That whole turn the other cheek, I, as I come back around, <laughs> well, I turn the other cheek. As I gain momentum, <laughs> come on, am I right? I don't agree with that, right? Give them your cloak. I give them my foot. <laughs> come on. Forgive them who persecute you and call you bad things. Really? Bless them? Bless them? But call down lightning. Come on, y'all hear what I'm saying? I'm trying to tell you how we become salt and light. We become salt and light by not obeying our own self, but by putting his kingdom first in us. And so whenever the Bible says if someone does you wrong, what are you to do? You're to forgive them. Say, but I don't want to forgive. I know, that's why it's so hard. That's why God said to do it. If you did it by nature, God wouldn't have said it. If you did it by nature, God wouldn't have said, hey, by the way, if somebody does you wrong, forgive them and pray for them. If you did that by nature, it'd be like, oh, they'll do it anyway. This is why God said what you should do to be salt and light in the earth. Amen? Amen. If my people, if my people. And then what's that mean? What's that mean in our culture? What's that mean in context of America? What's that mean? That means if someone agrees or disagrees with the Bible, I have to call it like I see it. This is what the Bible says. I remember there was one time uh, before the church was very large. The church was small. So immediately, here's what people think. When your church is small, they think you're stupid. But if your church is big, you're smart. I don't get it. <laughs> That's just how people think. Uh, and so someone calls me one time. And they said, uh, Pastor Charlie, I want, you to, I want you to tell me what I should do. I said, okay, what's up? Uh, I want to move in with my boyfriend. I want to sell all my stuff and move in with my boyfriend. They go, but I don't want your preacher answer. I just want your answer. <laughs> Are you thinking what I'm thinking? <laughs> Come on, how many of you know my preacher answer and my answer are the same? Amen. Right? Because my, watch, my faith is here. Right? And I believe God's word. That's where it's at. See, here's what they thought. They thought that the same way they view God in Christianity is the same way I view it. They think that my Christian standard is how somehow different than my life standard. I'm here to tell you it's the same. Amen? Amen? That's how you become salt and light. Well, people won't like you, but the, I'm salty. I'm salty. I'm salty. What matters? Me being salty. Amen? All right, let's continue. Here's what it says. Next one, next one is to watch, humble yourself. Oh, boy. Really, and I, I'm not going to belabor a lot of these, but let me just ask you. When you read the Bible... Do you look at it and go, I don't agree, or do you humble yourself and agree with it? Check this out. Humility is a funny thing because it's kind of like, well, let's take it this way. If you have, let's say you have an anger problem, and you, uh, you tear up your house every time you get mad and break all your stuff. Some of you laugh because you know you've been there. <laughs> Anybody else? You bunch of lying dogs. <laughs> How many of you have been mad and tore up your own stuff? And then you look at it back and you're like, well, that was stupid. i got to fix it. <laughs> I've been there, man. Been there. It used to be terrible about it. Now it's hard to get me mad. But anyway, and I ain't going to tell you how. Uh, but if I don't catch fit. But anyway, all right. 
But uh, no, on a serious note, though, I, I used to think that strong men lose their temper and break stuff. That's what I used to think. Oh, well, we're strong. We're tough. We tear up everything. Yeah, we tear up the whole house. No, that's just stupid. All right? Watch this. Strong men restrain their temper, restrain their tongue, and know how to conduct themselves. That's what strength does. Now, say, what's that got to do with humility? Humility is much the same in the sense of this. Oftentimes, we reference humility, and we think humility is weakness. I'm here to tell you humility is strength. Humility is strength. Humility is this. I choose to submit to the Lord. Watch this. If Michael comes home and he throws his clothes all over the the living room floor, and I say, Mike, pick up your clothes. And he says, and he picks them up, but he's fighting me the whole way. Is he humble? No. No. Let me ask you this. He comes home, he throws all his clothes on the floor. I say, Mike, Pick up your clothes. And he says, yep, got it, Dad, my bad, I I threw them there. Is that humility? Why is it humility? Why? Because watch this. He chose by an act of his heart to submit to what I asked him to do. Now, now, now watch. He may not understand that we need your clothes In your bedroom because that's where you live. He may not understand that. My point is, it's easy for us to submit when we understand. Sometimes it's harder for us to submit to God when we don't understand. And I'm here to tell you that humility is actually the key to receiving all that God has in your life. It's strength under submission to God. Humble. 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 I choose to submit to what God says. So if God says marriage is between a man and a woman, God doesn't care what you think. Here's what God desires for you to be humble. It's pride that says, I know better than God. I know what marriage should be. I know better. That's pride. It's humility that says, and I would never say this, but let's just go with it for an example. You know, I don't know why two men can't get married. I ain't got no problem with it. That's pride. Humility says, whatever God says, that's what I'm agreeing with. If you stand on your own, you're in pride. But if you stand on God's word, you're in humility. When you submit to God's word, Listen to what the Bible says about this. Listen to what, what it says right here. It says this uh, mm, right here. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all those be submissive one to another. And be clothed in what? Humility. For God, what? Resist the? Huh. You want God to face you and to, to resist you? Be proud. Be haughty in your own mind. I know it all. I can do it all. I don't need God. Come on, anybody see any problems in American culture right now? We don't need God. We're, 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 we're not a Christian nation. We don't need God in our schools. We don't need God in our government. We don't need God. We don't need God. Is that pride or humility? That's pride. Let me tell you, if we were all flat broke and didn't have any liberties, we wouldn't be saying that. We'd be screaming the opposite. God, come into our schools. God, come into our government. God, come into this. See, because there's something about when you succeed, somehow your focus gets off of what made you successful, and immediately you begin to more, get more caught up in other side rail things. What made America so great is that we kept our focus on the idea of being humble to God. What is destroying us now is we think we can do it now without God. And we're finding out, hopefully, prayerfully, hopefully, people are finding out we can't do it without God. America is not the greatest because we're the smartest. We're not. America is not the greatest because we have the most money, because we don't. America is the greatest because we have the greatest foundation, and that is a humility before God. Come on, amen? Amen, Amen, man. Look at it. It says, God resists the proud, but he gives what? Grace. Grace. What is that? unmerited favor to the humble. You want God to fight in your marriage? 
Humble yourself before God. You want God to fight for your finances? Humble yourself with your money. You want God to fight in your, your work, your business that you own? Humble yourself for God, and God will raise you up. That's what the Bible says. Humble yourself, and in due season, he will lift you up. Amen? How, does, how, do I, how do I humble myself, though, on a daily basis? Let me tell you one of the things that I used to do. I don't do it now because I'm not in the military, but before, when I was in the military, every day before I would leave to go to the, to, to go to the base, I, w- I would come up to my door, and this is when I first gave my heart to Christ. So I was a baby Christian. I didn't know whenever people talked about humbling their self before God. I didn't know what that meant, but I was doing my best to work it out. So what I would do is I would walk up to the door at the house, all right, we lived in a little apartment. I would walk up right before I'd walk out every day. I'd walk up, I would bow my knee just like this. And I'd say, Father, before I walk out this day, Lord, I ask that you protect Michelle, watch over Michelle, bless my day, protect me, Lord, lead me and guide me in all that I do. Give me favor with my boss. Lord, let me just do a good job today. Come on, y'all hear what I'm saying? What I'm doing is I'm just asking God, asking God, Lord, bless it. Lord, uh, and what you're doing is your humility It's humility. You're clothing yourself in humility. Now watch this. Whenever I stand up and I walk out that door, I know that I'm in a war. I know that there are going to be things pressing on me and try and take me down. But I know i got to stand for God and stand for righteousness and humble myself before Him. You hear what I'm saying? Even after we started the church, the church was a couple years old. We had a building uh, in Kokomo. And uh, every day at lunch, not every day, but any time I worked at SBC, I was a phone guy, and uh, some days I was working downtown or whatever, and I would go over to the church for lunch. I'd go over there, and I'd turn on some worship music, and I would just sit at the altar or lay down on my face or pray, you know, and just pray and ask God, Lord, bless our church, bless the people, Lord. I mean, and we were a little bitty church at that time, and I was like, Lord, just bless it and touch it, and no one knew that I was going there on my lunch hours. No one knew what I was doing, but what it had to do with more was about humility, humility, because I believe this. You ready? I believe humility in privacy is power in public. If you're humble and private to God, God will give you power in public places, man. I believe that. Purity, staying pure and humble before God, that's your way out. That's your way up. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Amen. All right. Here's the last one. You ready? You ready? Oh, no. I got, where are we at? Humble? Oh, wow. We ain't even going to make it. Pray. 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 How about that? Pray. Everybody say pray. All right, here's the next one. Confess your trespasses. This is James 5, 16. Confess your trespasses one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Why? The effective what? Fervent prayer of a righteous man does what? Avails much. Do you pray? Are you a praying person? Pastor Charlie, I want God to heal our land. All right. All right. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and do what? Pray. Every time you pray, you put angels in motion on your favor. Every time you pray, all of heaven is moving in your favor. You say, where did I get that? I got that from the Bible. You know, Daniel was a man who prayed, and the Bible says he prayed for 21 days. And here's what it says. It's in Daniel chapters 10 and Daniel chapter 11. Here's what the angel said. When the angel showed up and gave Daniel the interpretation of his dream, here's what the angel said, some powerful words. He said this, I was sent, this is Gabriel the archangel, said, I was sent the day you prayed. Y'all hear that? But it was 21 days before he got his answers. But how long did it take? 21 days before he got his answer met. When did God send the answer, though? Immediately. As soon as you start praying, God starts moving. That's my point. Why should you pray? You should pray because it moves God's hand in your life. And not only that, I'll tell you this, I believe it's a compass of your heart. It's amazing how God will change your prayers when you start praying. Like, Lord, kill them. Kill them, God. Kill them, God. Kill them. And then, you, and then the Lord will say, now, Charlie, you know that ain't right. I know, Lord. I'm sorry. I humble myself before you. I was going to turn the other cheek, Lord. I was going to turn it right around. But now that I've prayed about it, I feel better. Come on, anybody ever need to vent? I'll tell you the best person to vent to. God himself. Yeah. Say, Pastor Charlie, but I get mad when I vent. I do too. I tell him too. God, make these fish bite. (laughs) It's a joke. 
How many of you know God's real? God's real. God's real. I think of God this way a lot of times. My little niece sometimes, she'll jump up on my lap. She'll grab me by the face and turn my face towards her. Anybody know what I'm talking about? If you got little kids, you know what they do. They grab your face and turn it. It's like, I can hear you just fine looking that way. But okay, now I'm, I'm looking at you. Come on, y'all hear what I'm saying? And now listen, in the process of that though, oftentimes she will use her knee as leverage right in a certain area to get up in my face. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Come on, y'all know what I'm saying. All right? And now what, let me ask you this. Do I just suck it up and go with it or do I slap the kid off my lap? Huh? You just suck it up. It's like Whitney Houston, another song, Waiting to Exhale. <gasps> you know? You say, say what, what's the deal? What are you trying to say, Pastor Charlie? Get this. Sometimes we worry more about approaching God in the way we approach that we, we lo- it loses its authenticity. Okay? In other words, you don't have to worry about climbing up on God's lap and hurting him and him slapping you down. That's not the case. I delight in the fact that my niece crawls up on my lap and grabs my face and gets my attention. I dig it. It's cool. Am I upset that she claws it? No. Why? Why? Because, watch this, the relationship is more valuable than the side, secondary commotion that goes with it. And I'm here to tell you God's the same way with your prayers. So people are all, all the time, Pastor, I just don't know how to do it. I don't know. Hey, just start by talking to him just like you would anybody else. Amen? Yeah. Amen. All right. That's, that's that. Here's the last one. I'm going to give it to you. Seek his face. Y'all hear that? Seek his face, which had to do with what I was just saying. Grabbing a hold of him and saying, God, listen to me. This is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking about. It's amazing this, that... When you seek God's face, his hands are not far from him. Seek his face. Spend some time seeking his face. Here's the last one I'm going to give you. And turn from their wicked ways. Oh boy, let me just kind of break this down for you for a minute. This was a big push in the 80s, I believe. I believe this started back in the 80s. Came through the 90s and now into the 2000s. We don't even call sin, sin anymore. If you got somebody who, let's say, is an alcoholic, they don't, they don't have an alcoholism. It's a, it's a sickness. It's alcoholism. It's not sin. It's, it's, they got a sickness. They got a sickness, you know? It was like random. Jumped up on them. Made them go down to the liquor store. You know, why? Well, you know, you know they had bad parents. You know? They were born in the wrong side of town. They got the wrong skin color. I mean, after all, they were cut from peewee football, you know, they got bad grades, mama didn't cook them Pop-Tarts in the morning. I mean, we've got all these crazy ideas of what people's sicknesses are. And may I propose to you, most of what the world calls sickness, God didn't say a sickness at all. He calls it wicked. He calls it evil. He calls it evil and wicked. Let me explain to you something to you. Addiction to anything is addiction. All right? You know, I'm not going to say all addiction is evil or anything like that, but I'm saying addiction to something leads you to sin. Sin. Alcoholic. An alcoholic, that is sinful. Sinful. Right? Right? Okay? Hey, check this out. Two men being together. I don't care how you call it. It's sinful. Sinful. Well, they were born that way. Okay, okay. All right, let's just go there. You want to go there? Let's go there. They were born that way. Yep, I agree. (gasps) That shock you? Shocks you that I would agree that people were born homosexuals? I didn't say they were born homosexual. I said they were born with a sin nature on the inside. I said they were born in sin. Shaped in iniquity, the Bible says. They were born in sin. That means they have no idea of what wicked is and wicked isn't. Oh, but they love people. Okay, that's right. I I can't marry my bass boat. 
I can't marry five women, nor do I want to, for the record. <laughs> no wonder what that. You know what I'm saying, man? I got one. Safe. <laughs> I'm going to stop right there before it gets really weird. But here's the truth. Here's the truth. Oh, Pastor Charlie, but they were born that way. Okay, they were born in sin. That's the bottom line, right? And I'm not against nobody. You're a hater. No, I'm a lover. Why? Because I love them enough to tell them the truth that will set them free. Yeah, 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 yeah. Pastor Charlie, you just don't know. We got family members. I got family members. I got family members, homosexual. What do you tell them? Same thing. Same exact thing. Why? It's the truth that will set them free. Amen. What is it? It's wicked. It's evil. If you sleep with your neighbor's wife, guess what? That's evil. Well, I grew up in a bad neighborhood. Mama didn't make no chocolate cake. It doesn't matter. It's evil. It's wicked. I don't care what led you there. It's evil. If you steal, it's evil. Well, no, they just, they just were poor. A lot of us were poor. I don't mean that's okay. Come on, you hear what I'm saying? See, in our culture, it's hard for us to turn from our wicked ways when we won't even acknowledge it's wicked. That's what's so frustrating. I want America to wake up. I want our church people to wake up. You got preachers in pulpits who don't think homosexuality is sinful. First of all, if we ever say that from this place, I give you permission to leave because I'm with you. I'm, with, I'm, right, I'm right with you. And I will never hire nobody or anything else. Mm -mm, we ain't doing all that. We ain't doing that. Why? It's evil. It's wrong. It's sin. It's sin. Amen? We got enough devils to fight. We don't need to bring them in. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, man? Anybody else picking up what I'm putting down? You smell what I'm cooking? We have to call evil, evil, and sin, sin. Amen? Sin, sin, and evil, evil. Quit muddy in the waters. I think it's a trick of the enemy. I think the trick of the enemy is for us not to call sin, sin, so that we don't have to call it what it is, so that we don't turn from those wicked ways. Because it's amazing how once you take something in your life and you say, you know what, that is sinful. The way I did that person was sinful. The way I acted towards that person was sinful. That was sinful. Once you put a label on it, sinful, it's amazing how your heart will automatically say, you know what, I probably shouldn't be doing that no more. It's amazing how you're wired. As soon as you call it what it is, God says, now that you see it for what it is, I'm going to help you power through it and get over it. Amen? Once you call it what it is. But until you call it what it is, you're not being humble. You're being proud, trying to make excuses for something that's evil and wicked. Pastor Charlie, I thought we were healing America. We are, but we got to start right here. Right. Call evil, evil, and sin, sin. Ask God to forgive us for it. We move forward. Now, let's look at the verse all in together, and then I'll close, and I'll be done. And some of you are like, yes, yes, yes. Here it is. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, we got to call it for what it is, then, here's what God says, I will hear from what? Heaven. I will what? Forgive their sin. And I will heal their land. We want God to heal America? That's what it's going to take. It's going to take some of us being like the shamas, being like the men and women of God that God made us to be, to stand up and say, at work, stand up and say in our places, say, you know what, that's evil, that's wrong. And I'm not picking a fight, I'm not trying to argue with you, I'm saying that's evil and that's wicked and that's wrong and God wants us to turn from that and we're not to be in agreement with that. Come on, y'all hear what I'm saying? The standard is very clear in the Bible and here's the kicker, you ready for this, y'all? Most people know the standard. Most people do. I'm asking you today, will you stand up for the standard though? Will you stand up for that standard? Will you say, no, this is right? There are things in the Bible that I don't agree with. I told you that. But nevertheless, I have to agree with that standard because it'll set people free and set me free. Amen?